I'm Nishira from the Lost Codex, and today I have the awesome opportunity to do a developer interview highlighting the upcoming Mega Dungeon in 1015, Dawn of the Infinite. Before we dive into questions proper, would you two mind introducing yourselves and talking a little bit about what you do? Sure. Uh, my name is Steven Cavallero. I'm a senior encounter designer on the World of Warcraft team, and I helped bring the, the, the Mega Dungeon, Dawn of the Infinite, to, to life. Hello, my name is Morgan Day. I am one of the associate game directors on World of Warcraft, and uh, I do things relating to and adjacent to uh, like systems, encounters, rewards, things like that. So Dawn of the Infinite and uh, the Mega Dungeon are things that I'm very excited about as well. Okay. Uh, I have done the dungeon as of a week ago. Um, I did Alliance, though. I didn't get to do, like, the Horde encounter or Horde on Alliance encounter. Um, but starting broadly, compared to the relatively isolated stories of Mechagon and Tazafesh, the story in Dawn of the Infinite is far more heavy narratively and important to the overall expansion. Were there any challenges in tackling that? Yeah, definitely. I, you know, it's something that we're really excited about, as you mentioned, being able to sort of progress the main uh, plot line of Dragonflight in Dawn of the Infinite. Um, but of course, you know, when we're when we're dealing with heavy lore characters and things like that, we want to make sure that we're representing them in ways that we're happy with from from a gameplay perspective. That sort of ties into their character and helps to make it even stronger, right? So, as an example, um, Aridicron. Right, Aridicron is a character that I think players have come to be very intrigued by because he seems to be a little bit different, maybe, than other villains of of World of Warcraft's past. Um, you know, compared to his sibling Farak, who seems to be maybe more of a loose cannon, certainly very powerful. Uh, Aridicron, who also seems to wield tremendous power, is maybe a little bit more of a strategist or a planner, a, a patient thinker, right? And so we wanted to try to make sure we were carrying that into the gameplay itself in in dawn of the infinite and i i think you know ultimately you'll see uh, in fact in fact it sounds like you've, you've experienced it um sort of this this back and forth between aridicron and your group and chromie who's there to offer support and sort of how he's testing you and pushing you to your limits um because ultimately um as he said himself he doesn't take you lightly he doesn't underestimate you and that's something that's interesting and we really wanted to sort of um to sort of hit on that uh with with that character um i think another challenge was how do we introduce uh the concept of galakrond into the game for the first time and do so in a way that makes sense for a a mega dungeon right for dawn of the infinite and so what we really wanted to try to show was let's go back and and look at the moment that galakrond fell and communicate that story about his sort of you know necromantic decay like energy and really sell that so you're going to see dead dragons being risen you're going to see um, the effects of his death on the surrounding area and you know ultimately why dragon blight is named what it is i mean this is this is why the the area is called dragon blight um so i think overall we were just really excited about being able to have a longer form small group experience to be able to tell this kind of story um that you know might otherwise be more difficult for example in like a normal dungeon that's that's released you know ready to go for 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 mythic plus right there's a timer it's 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 an experience that's much more tailored to uh, a smaller window of play with with dawn of the infinite at release we know we can kind of have players engaging with the content for a long enough period of time to to be able to delve into those details um, for me, something that was really cool to kind of get to explore and have, you know, watch the team explore was, you know, really the incarnates are something that we have been really building up throughout the whole expansion, right? Like we saw them in the vault of the incarnates, right? With Razagath. And then we saw her kind of release her her clutch mates. And even most recently with Embers on Neltharion, right? We got to see that awesome uh, intro cinematic where Farak like leaps into the sky and crashes into the earth and kind of opens the path towards their like cavern. And I love in that cinematic where Eurocron's like, all right, peace out. Um, Y'all go have fun down there. I got some other plans. And, you know, initially you're like, well, what is this, what is this person up to? So this is an opportunity for the team to really get to 
continue that story of the incarnates and how, while they are the incarnates, they have their own motivations. They have their own ideas and goals, and they're all very unique and different in that regard. So this has been really, really cool to watch Eritokron's kind of plans and what, what he's been up to. I love his boss fight. I just think it's super clever how he has that sort of like stacking melee debuff against the tank, but the fight is designed around making him do that as less as least as possible because he has all these long cast times. And I was looking at that and I was like, that's such a clever way to tell a story through a mechanic. He feels like a raid boss in a dungeon in a way that I feel like others haven't quite as much before. Like, you know, if he keeps hitting you, you will die. Regarding the Mythic Plus thing that I was actually going to fold into my next question, do you ever feel like knowing that these are going to be like Mythic Plus dungeons, does that ever influence how much story or how many like NPC interactions you can put in a dungeon versus putting more emphasis on that in like the surrounding question? Um, not... I'd like to say not really, right? Like, <laughs> like there are certainly parts that like we we absolutely understand that yes, this is an instance that, you know, actually in the not too distant future, in 1017, actually, we will be splitting this dungeon, uh, the Dawn of the Infinite, into two, similar to what you might have seen us do in the past with like Tazavish and previous mega dungeons, where they kind of get split into two and then they get rolled into the Mythic Plus season. That's absolutely the plan for this as well. We will see Dawn of the Infinite in Mythic Plus. And as we, you know, are developing it, we have those un un expectations and understanding. But ultimately, you know, we design this as a mega dungeon first, with the experience of what the players, what we want the players to see and feel there. And we always feel like we, you know, <laughs> a thing we say often is like, you know, future us will be smarter, right? Like, <laughs> like we'll figure this out in the future. We'll find a way to create clever solutions here. Um, sorry, heroic will be in ten one seven is what I meant to say, and. Um, the mega dungeon won't be till, or the the mythic plus introduction won't be till later season. But um, you know, we always think about considerations for how that's going to play out in mythic plus, um, and we have a ton of knobs there, right? Like even with freehold this season, I think it's been fun. You know, there's a lot of RP that happens in that instance, but people find you know kind of clever ways, like oh, if someone go run ahead, trigger that, and you know you can kind of pull trash while you're doing that. So there's ways that you can play around that. Um, and then there's also been times with, I want to say, Halls of Valor. Uh, you know, everyone loves God King Skovold. Uh, He's quite verbose. Uh, <laughs> and sometimes we will make changes there. But ultimately, we want to make sure that we're keeping the core of the story intact, um, it, even if we do need to find ways to kind of truncate some of those uh, scenes that might play out. So that it really keeps the spirit of what's happening without, you know, um, really impacting that too negatively. So yeah, definitely is a consideration. But when it comes to the Mega Dungeon, the goal is to make that feel like as epic and awesome an experience first, and then we can solve Mythic Plus problems later. Yeah, and and to kind of to add on to that too, like with Dawn of the Infinite, as we were planning out some of these moments, we we did discuss like, okay, now when this moment occurs in you know Mythic Plus, is there a, is there a way that we can maybe change it or truncate it so that it works to to Morgan's point, where it still feels like you're getting the core of what's there, but you're able to you know. Um, maybe get get through it faster or whatever uh for for the you know, in intricacies of what players would expect in in a timed experience cool that answers my next question so in a very lore heavy dungeon like this um how does the encounter design process work like is it in this case more a matter of looking at the lore and figuring out what would make sense or does it start as a cool idea that gets tailored to fit the lore sort of like 50 50 I, I think this is one of the one of the coolest things about working with you know a, a diverse group of opinions and disciplines, right? Is really a lot of these things can start from from anywhere, and then we all come together and say, "Hey, you know, l l let me use my team's expertise to help flesh this out," right? And so with Dawn of the Infinite, I think where we sort of started in in terms of you know the the the, the core direction was we know that there are these two sort of um, co-plot lines in Dragonflight, one with the Incarnates and, and their storyline, one with the Bronze Dragonflight, with Chromie trying to protect the, or stop Nosdormu from, from you know, ultimately succumbing to this fate of Murazond. And we have this really, really cool sort of area in Thaldrassus, the Temporal Conflux. How can we maybe marry these plot lines together for this piece of content in a way where uh, we are 
progressing the storyline, but at the same time, doing it in a way that feels uh, relevant to time, but time that time and periods that feel relevant to those storylines. And what I mean by that is, you know, right away that led us to, okay, we want to be able to use time as a means to bring players to cool epic parts of the Warcraft universe that they otherwise just simply would not be able to experience. And with Riddicron and the Primal Incarnates, the Proto-Dragon story was an interesting thing to try to explore, particularly Galakrond. And so we were able to sort of use this as the jumping off point of we can go to ancient dragon blight before it was named dragon blight and see the moment where this happens and be able to explore that storyline. And because it's proto dragon story, right. We can sort of have some, some tie into the story of the, of the incarnates um, and then mix that in with uh, Chromie who's there walking you through this time period, explaining what you're seeing and sort of trying to help you navigate, you know, foiling the plans of whatever a Riddicron and the infinite dragon flight is up to bringing that all together. And so that, that was sort of where we started was, okay, this is, this is a, a great opportunity to, to sort of tell this story. Um, and, and I think uh, while, you know, certainly there are always challenges, like I mentioned earlier, when dealing with, with, with lore heavy, uh, characters, you know, making sure that we're trying to, you know, stay accurate to what players expect from their character, from their storylines. You know, it, it's certainly a fun experience when it all comes together. Um, yeah, I mean, Stephen just mentioned, you know, really the high level fantasy. The instance itself really does begin with a question of, okay, well, who's the big bad, right? And why are we going in there? Um, part of your question, I think, was on specific encounters, and for that one in particular, that's kind of the joy of game development and designers and people, you know, people are different. There are different types of creatives, right? Like there's people who really dig into the fantasy of what this gonna, is going to be. And then they kind of design their individual encounter around that. And then there's people who really enjoy coming up with like, here's the mechanic I want. Here's the gameplay I want. You might have heard like top down versus bottom up, right? Like that is really an individual person's own preference and what you know kind of jives with their style of design so that's very much something that like different designers on the team might have different styles there so you're going to end up with different approaches which is again one of the great joys of having a really diverse team of just different opinions and different uh, approaches and there's no one correct way but you know the end result is always really epic and awesome i love watching uh that all come together on the team have you ever like come up with a mechanic or a part of a fight that like narrative or someone had to be like, that doesn't really work for the story rather than like technical reasons? Yeah, I, I have a specific example actually with Dawn of the Infinite. Um, so very early on when we were planning out a Riddicron's fight, we, we knew you, you were going to have a companion with you helping you. And we knew that Chromie was, was there for a large portion of the dungeon. Uh, but in this particular case, we were actually going to have Tyr show up and help you fight a Riddicron. Um, but very early on, we realized that that's not... For lore reasons, uh, he he really can't be there. Uh, he just he can't. So instead, we we pivoted to say, "Hey, um, Chromie's helping you out throughout the rest of the dungeon. Why why wouldn't she come with you to to to, to fight against the Riddicron? And you know, she has time support powers that she can use to assist you. It just makes sense for her to be there. And so we really dove deeper in, into that. And and I think it turned out great. I think it's great that she's there. And, and I'm happy, you know, that we actually went that direction because I think we got a lot of cool uh, gameplay out of Chromie being there. Yeah, we have an amazing narrative team. And I, I made a bit of a face there when you said that because I was like, well, you know, even this example Stephen had, that was the first time I heard that, which is really cool. But like, ultimately, you know, the, the group got to do what they wanted to do, right? The the mechanic that they wanted to implement, we were able to find a way to make that fit within the narrative. And our narrative team is really awesome where it's like, oh, if that if that's what you want to do, you know, maybe that specific example with, you know, um, that person showing up doesn't make sense, but hey, it totally makes sense to do this, right? So there's a really fun collaborative process that happens there where, uh, you know, if you can come up with a cool idea, there's almost always a way to make that kind of fit narratively uh with you know there's obviously exceptions to every rule but more times than not you know that's the kind of outcome i love to see and what the team often comes up with really clever solutions for things like that that's so cool was was like tier retrofitted as a boss after that or was that like the plan that he would be a boss that was actually that always the plan yeah yeah that okay. was always the plan so um it, when we were actually planning early on 
that fight and assuming that tier would be there with the Riddickron, we were actually talking about like, are there ways that we can have a Riddickron or sorry, tier show abilities during the Riddickron fight that then are like repurposed as evil versions during the tier fight. Um, and so some of those, at, you know, the early discussions still ultimately made it into what, what the, the, the tier fight encompasses, but yeah, it's definitely something that was planned from the beginning that, that, infinite tier would, would be would be part of the dungeon for sure cool. yeah i remember the early the early conversations there were really you know as you come in through the mega dungeon for kind of your 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 loop back through with the timeline all wonky now we we really had a discussion around like okay we need to like hit you over the head with like you're not in kansas anymore right like this is really different wow something went way wrong how do we achieve that and tier was one of like first things somebody brought up was like well <laughs> what if like all right cool <laughs> that'll do the trick speaking of timeline corrections knowing that morshi is a boss fight but we sort of i guess spoilers beware um like kill her in correcting the timeline is there a chance we'll see her or other infinite dragons again going forward? Uh, I think uh, honestly, the answer here is you know the possibilities are 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 infinite, as, <laughs> as they say, especially when it comes to uh, situations like these with uh, with time. So, um, my biggest question is: Does this sort of resolve the Morazon crisis for Anazdormu, or are we going to see a lot more story on that going forward? Um, I think it certainly uh, goes into a, a lot more detail, right, regarding uh, this this event and you know trying to stop this event. Um, I think to answer that question, right, we would never say never say never for things, mm -hmm. but it certainly is uh, is a storyline that will be. Uh, bookended for for now uh by the end of dawn of the infinite gotcha yeah anything is possible with timey wimey shenanigans the relic that eridicron uses to drain galacron chromi says it's a dragon soul like device is there anything you can tell us about it like its purpose its name or what its function is rather yeah so it's certainly a a, a mysterious artifact for sure it is indeed a device that designed by Neltharion. Um, and, you know, it, ha it has properties similar to that of the Dragon Soul, as as you might remember, Chromie even mentions it during, during the fight. Um, uh, you know, it, it can siphon, it contain vast energies. Um, but in terms of specifics, you, you will learn more about that, including its name, um, its official name in, in future story updates. Exciting. Okay. So we know that Galakron's, like, decay powers were inadvertently brought about by his corruption, thanks to yogg Saron, seeing as his change in behavior after drinking corrupted water prompted him to cannibalize his fellow dragons. So when Eridocron is using that relic to drain Galakrond, it looks sort of voidy. Is there something to it, or is that just what his essence looks like, given his corruption? Yeah, definitely uh, interesting observation there. I think, um, so the way we look at it is... Um, Sort of as revealed in Tyr's writings that were uncovered in in Dragon in Dragonflight, um, Galakron did ingest waters that were tainted by the influence of Yog Saron. But um, Galakron also manifested powers of necromancy and decay on his own, with you know, eating eating the dragons and doing things that he really shouldn't have been doing. Um, so I wouldn't say it's like so simple to say he was just corrupted purely by the void. Um, so no, I, I would not say that Galakron should should be considered an incarnate of decay really he sort of he predates the incarnates and, and also would have been quite happy to consume them as he did many other proto dragons um or at the time they weren't proto dragons just dragons uh as he was trying to do with with all of dragon kind interesting i was i was gonna ask that too you're reading my mind um so if the primalist movement i guess if he predates it and it kicked off after him is it realistic to say that they perhaps like considered him a martyr or was it just like sort of separate? Yeah, I think that's, that's a really interesting question. I, I think um, for, for the incarnates at the time that, that Galakron was alive, they, they were just normal primal dragons, um, 
very similar to the five that would eventually become the aspects. And um, they they were not followers of Galakrond, um, but it's it's safe to say that they knew who he was. And, and it's also safe to say that they feared him. Um, so ultimately, I think that when they look at Galakrond, they, they, they ultimately infuse themselves with the power of the elements, not to emulate Galakrond, but really just to be able to stand toe to toe with the aspects. Um, so sort of completely changing topics, I guess. So we know Mechagon has an, a, an accessible, uninstanced version. Could we expect to see something like that for the temporal conflicts in the future, maybe? Um, yeah, that's a really um, awesome idea, you know, kind of for future us. That's one of the great parts of World of Warcraft is just as we continue to update the story and as we, you know, are introduced to these awesome new places like the the temporal conflicts like we are in this instance. Um, you know, that is now opportunity for us to kind of do some interesting storytelling in the future. So while, um, you know, this is really our introduction to it um, and we don't have plans, you know, it, certainly not in the um, uh, Fractures in Time update to kind of return there, that does now have a new door that is opened for uh, for us to explore in the future. So uh, nothing to announce right now, but definitely uh, a cool new space that we would also like to explore. Yeah, it's so pretty. I love the skybox so much. Um, so Mechagon and Tazavesh have some really cool, unique rewards, um, such as the hard mode mounts. Besides the infinite dragons, are there any unique rewards planned for this one? Uh, yeah, so we definitely wanted to make sure that the rewards uh, found inside Dawn of the Infinite were, you know, sort of commensurate with the level of challenge and difficulty that we're sort of asking players to overcome um, as it being more like a small group raid. Um, so in terms of, you know, the power level of rewards, we, we think players will find it to be, uh, you know, me meaningful uh, in terms of uh, something along the lines of end of heroic level raid loot. Um, in terms of raw item level, but I think one of the things we're excited about, and we don't want to get into too many specifics because we want to keep it a surprise, but some of the items have some interesting um, sort of uh, effects, you know, on, on use effects or passive effects, things like that, that make them interesting and tie them into the theme of time. And I think those will be things that, that players are interested in. And then in terms of uh, cosmetics beyond um, the infinite uh, dragon riding skins that you mentioned, um, there's, there's some stuff that uh, we have up our sleeve that I think uh, transmog, uh, fans and collectors will will definitely be interested in 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 going after i know we've been talking about tier a bit you know tears hammer i know when i saw that i immediately said that's gonna drop right <laughs> so that's definitely something that you know the rewards team is excited to make sure that you know often whenever you see those awesome weapons i want i want to loot that thing off the corpse and be able to wield it so yeah that's definitely one of those items that i'm certainly looking forward to Oh, that's so exciting, especially as a paladin player who has the silver hand. It's perfect. It's perfect for me. <laughs> um, going back a little bit, the time lost battlefield. Were there any other like big names or events considered for that boss fight, or did you just like you wanted to do that one from the start? There actually were. Um, that was one of the things that we we talked a lot about in terms of what we thought we could we could maybe do there. Um. One, uh, we we even talked about like what if this was a major uh, villain that you fight like in an alternate way. I think uh, ultimately we wanted to move towards something that uh, had more of like a, a faction uh, identity, not so much like literally horde and alliance, but more like group. Like for example, not just a singular character, but something that was more about like a group. And we were and we thought, okay, well, what if we actually? You know, one of the things we've been doing in Dragonflight, right, is. Um, sort of making it more accessible for Alliance and Horde players to play together. But this is an important part of Warcraft history, the Alliance versus the Horde. And what if there was this concept of an un unending, never-ending battlefield where the two factions just uh, basically got stuck in time fighting each other? And so we ultimately went towards that because we felt like it sort of gave us that sort of group identity that, that we were looking for in that particular encounter. Um, I should mention here that we have, you know, planned for the fact that we we, we are being more friendly towards uh uh horde and alliance players playing together in our in our in our content in terms of how that works and so in this particular case the the group leader faction determines uh the the boss that you will encounter um, we felt that that was a reasonable compromise to still allow us to tell this little kind of cool story um but still be um you know 
understanding of our current systems and the direction we want to go with making that stuff more accessible. I would say for the last question, um, just a free for all, is there anything you didn't get to cover that you would like to, or just something that you sort of want to say in closing? Yeah. One, one thing I'll add real quick, I wanted to actually expand a tad on, on one of the answers I'd given you about um, the at the end of, of Dawn of the Infinite in terms of you mentioned the, the Murazon plot line. I, one thing I didn't actually mention that I thought of while we were talking about something else is there, while the, the, the core, you know, plot line of that Murazon, uh, sort of tale does get resolved. There are certainly like follow-up quests that take place after the dungeon. Also some in future updates that will continue to examine the future of the infinite flight. The infinite flight is not going away. Um, but we don't want to spoil any of that for you mm. for now. Yeah, not only like Stephen just said with the content that you're going to find after the fact, but, um, you know, it, as is always our goal to kind of surprise and delight players, something that you have, uh, you know, come, come, come to appreciate. Uh, and I've, sorry, I've come to appreciate is that really, those really awesome, like cinematics and videos that kind of play during, uh, the content update. And we always, you know, try to keep those locked down and, um, something that we are really excited about without getting into spoilers is just the really fun stories and awesome interactions that you're going to get to see with this update uh, as we dive into, like I mentioned, the personality of these incarnates and especially some of the ones that we haven't heard so much from and what the story is there and what's going on with that. So I'm really excited for people to get to get their hands on this update once it's out because there's a lot of fun uh, kind of secrets that people won't be able to see on the on the test room. I'm so excited. Thank you so much. This has been such a treat and such a privilege and I'm very grateful. Oh, we were happy to talk with you. We were, we were excited and happy, happy to do it. Yeah, thank you so much for your time. It was awesome to chat. <laughs> <laughs>